Next to me is believed to be the grave of Chief Pathkiller, who was the principal chief of the Cherokee people. He was involved in the War of 1812, but his relationship with the white settlers quickly went south. After a period of time, there was a white exploration party led by a man named Moore, and uh, after being caught, a group of 20 of them were sentenced to be bound and burned alive. Principally Moore, they wanted to punish the leader of this party, but Moore fell in love with Chief Pathkiller's daughter, and they went to escape into the mountains of Tennessee. Chief Pathkiller pursued them, but because it was winter, they found a spot in the mountains and hid out in the snow. They had one horse with them and quickly began starving because they couldn't leave their camp at all after fearing of leaving footsteps in the snow, which they would easily be able to track. However, uh, they waited there long enough and eventually were able to escape, and the love story between Moore and Pathkiller's daughter became pretty famous. But Pathkiller himself stayed in this village for a long period of time, and later took on more progressive attitudes towards the white settlers and towards colonization in general. Uh, but it does mark a very interesting kind of parallel between the English and settler relationships of the Cherokee and the more traditionalist, pure-blooded Cherokee factions, and what would later become the mixed-blood English-Cherokee factions that would emerge out of that uh, Indian school in Connecticut. As I was saying over at Chief Pathkiller's grave, the Cherokee Nation took on a different character once they began breeding with the white settlers, and the chiefs went from pure-blooded Cherokee into more mixed-race chiefdoms. So this is very much characterized by people like Harriet Boudinot next to me, and she was born to a English colonel, and the marriage took place at a Indian boarding school up in Connecticut. But there was quite a scandal because other marriages of powerful people within the tribe also took place at this boarding school just a couple years prior. And it became very clear that the tribe was being turned into something of an English satellite state because they wanted loyalists in America. And like Stand Wadi, like other Cherokee leaders, her husband was a firm believer in Indian removal because he believed their tribe was small and would later come to be genocided or wiped out completely by the white settlers if they didn't move. And on her deathbed in 1836, she expressed her deepest wish that the Cherokee would convert to Christianity. And shortly after her death, the same year, her husband was forced on the Trail of Tears over to Oklahoma. And much like uh, Chief McIntosh, he was also killed by Cherokee who were very, very angry at the fact that he was complicit in the Trail of Tears and in Indian relocation. finally made it to the summit of Brasstown Bald, or as the Cherokee would call it, Enotá. Now, Brasstown Bald is a fascinating place, and it's unfortunately very, very foggy right now, but we are fortunate enough to get a little break in the rain for a minute. Now, I learned all these stories sitting around a campfire in the North Georgia Mountains with Boy Scouts. I was very lucky to have that kind of upbringing. But Brasstown Bald plays a part in the Cherokee Noah's Ark story. According to their lore, there was a global flood, and they took refuge, or a small number of Cherokee families took refuge in a big canoe. And this canoe, once the waters had receded a little bit, took shelter on the summit of Brasstown Bald, or as they called it, Enota. But at the time, there were trees all over the top of it, but there was no game to be found because it had died during the flood. So the Great Spirit came along and took all the trees off the top of Brasstown, and so from then forward, it was named Brasstown Bald. Now, when the flood waters receded, the Cherokee spread out and populated the Cherokee Nation. Now, to the Cherokee, who had never left their nation, this mountain, being the tallest summit in Georgia and Cherokee territory, was their Mount Everest. It was the tallest mountain in their world view. So it took immense spiritual importance. And in their mythology, when the waters receded, the stones, especially the soapstone, were still soft. So when the animals that the Great Spirit provided populated the valleys, they stepped over the stone in Track Rock Gap, which is also an incredibly sacred site just at the summit of Enota, and I hope to come back to these places in a few days when the weather clears out, but it's still beautiful any time of year. It's been a bit of a hike to get up to this point, but I wanted to show you these guys. I don't know the name of them, I'll throw it in the video, but Back in Boy Scouts, these were always kind of fun to find. They don't have any use, but they look very ghostly. 
they don't have any chlorophyll so I think they're parasitic and kind of live off of the nutrients on the trees around them but they're very mysterious because you can only find them in the darkest dampest parts of the valleys The history of the Cherokee in the East is dotted with people called Beloved Man and Beloved Woman. Now, in order to be bestowed with this title, you had to earn it. You were not in hereditary line to become a chief or to become an elder, although you have displayed some act of courage or some act of heroine that allows you to be given this title that is a universal symbol of respect. And Nancy Ward earned this in 1755 when she attended a battle with the Creeks with her husband, a man named Chief Kingfisher. And when Chief Kingfisher died in the battle after, and actually it was very interesting, she would bite the bullets so they would inflict maximum damage against the creek. But when her husband died, rather than fade into the background, she grabbed his musket and held it over her head at the most pivotal moment of the battle and rallied the Cherokee against the Creeks. And they came out victorious. And for this, she was given the title Beloved Woman. And her life is a life of really just epic proportions. She became a prophetess. She became a friend to the American patriots when the Revolutionary War came along, and for that she's actually celebrated yearly by the United Daughters of the uh, Revolutionary War. And she also became a, a local, very just respected woman. She had negotiations with the settlers. She negotiated things within her tribe, and using the ability to grant pardons, she actually got several people out of jail. One of these was a white female settler who knew a lot about dairy farming, and she introduced Nancy Ward, who later introduced her tribe, to cattle and to dairy farming. And this was a very new thing for them. And it increased profits for the Cherokee quite a bit. And when the town of Coda experienced some political turmoil, she came along the banks of the river here, where she opened up an inn along the Federal Road. And so she is celebrated to this day with a Nancy Ward gravesite state park. And she's buried alongside some of her family, but this is an incredibly important and sacred spot to the Cherokee people. And I thought I would tell her story because I think it's a really fascinating one. Back again up in North Georgia, you'll find Red Clay State Park. And this state park, the entrance is actually in Georgia, but the state park itself is in the state of Tennessee. And what's so fascinating about this place is that it was the last headquarters for the Cherokee national government before the enforcement of the 1830 Indian Removal Act. And they really remained within their own home nation until 1838 when the US military finally cracked down and forced them to leave. Now this site here, the site of Red Clay, was their last sort of headquarters, their last Congress, and they held their last meetings here. And between the years of 1832 and 1838, 11 general sessions or tribal meetings were held here. Ceremonies were performed, and it is a sacred land to the Cherokee. It actually has the site of the Blue Hole Spring, which they consider holy ground. And behind me is their eternal flame. Now, the Cherokee Nation always did keep flames burning. A lot of these flames were held atop ancient burial mounds or ancient sacred mounds that were passed down from the woodland culture to the Mississippian culture to the Cherokee people. The one behind me was kept burning in this site, although now it's kept burning as a memorial to the people who died on the Trail of Tears. And this site is fascinating because although nothing really remains of the original site, you get a feel for where they lived, the beautiful mountains around here. And like most villages, it was completely wiped off the map. The site of New Dakota 
is in fact underneath the cemetery and there's only one original building there, the one belonging to the missionary. The site for Coda is now underneath the reservoir and the site here is now just overgrown with woodland and they've built a couple of barns to memorialize and remember what happened here in the 1830s. Behind me is the Blue Spring, which is an incredibly sacred place to the Cherokee Nation in the east, as well as to other tribes which inhabited this region even before them. And the story goes that the spring springs up from a world exactly like ours, with people, plants, and animals, that is below us. Although the seasons are different, because the water which wells up is always a different temperature. And to enter this underworld, you need a guide from the underworld, you need to fast and then visit the waters, and the guide will guide you underneath where you consult with the elders there. Now this spring was the site and provided the water for the tribal meetings held between 1832 and 1838 with the enforcement of the Indian Removal Act by U.S. troops. It was a site where they roundly rejected, wholly and unanimously, this act. Although the U.S. government didn't recognize their tribal authority, it eventually forced them to Oklahoma. As the sun sets over what used to be the town of Coda, I wanted to tell the story of Chief Okonostora. Now, this chief next to me was for 40 years the war chief of the Cherokee Nation. He was born in 1710 and initially had very good relations with the British settlers. However, as I mentioned earlier at the mound in uh, a little bit south of here, there was a explorer from Scotland that came along and just crowned a man named Utu Moitoy as the emperor of the Cherokee. And this drove a wedge between the more coastal or foothill tribes and the interior tribes led by men like Okonostoda. And Okonostoda really began a brutal ground war against the British occupation. And this really reached ahead in the year 1760 when the British massacred two dozen Cherokee chiefs or local village elders and leaders that they had POW in Fort Loudon. This began a period whereby Chief Okonostoda led a force to massacre, lay siege to Fort Loudon, and the British were forced to flee in a mad dash to Virginia. They killed dozens of British soldiers, and it really began a hard ground war. Now, Okonostoda was made beloved man in 1780, very shortly before his death. And I mean, he had a very long career behind him. He was a war chief for four decades and a very influential elder in the clan afterwards. And as beloved man, he enjoyed very wide political recognition and really helped his people come to really just the pinnacle of their power. But sadly, this would later kind of wane as the British moved in, as we saw at the new Okoda Cemetery. And Okoda was buried, or sorry, Okonostoda was buried in this village of Kota. And for the longest time, we didn't know where he was, and he, it was flooded. This village now lies underneath the reservoir, along with several other Cherokee capitals. But in the early 20th century, or sometime in the 20th century, not the early 20th century, the Tennessee Valley Authority discovered, yeah. while doing underwater archaeology, a pair of glasses that clearly belonged to him. So they gave him a grave by raising the ground probably about at least a third to a half a mile behind us, where there's a beautiful trail. And now there's the Coda Memorial, which memorializes this lost village. And it memorializes the clans of Cherokee that were forced into Oklahoma. But to see the grave of this Cherokee war chief is surprisingly powerful and very impressive, especially as the sun is setting on it.
number of different clans, but they kind of like families. Earlier on at the grave of Junaluska, I mentioned that a lot of Cherokee from North Carolina went on to join the Confederacy, or specifically to Thomas's Legion of Cherokee Highlanders. And one of these, or the most influential one of these, was Captain Jarrett Nimrod Smith. Now, Smith was born in 1837, one year before the U.S. government decided to enforce the Indian Removal Act, but Smith was a very influential person. He was mixed race, and he was born into a Cherokee family. Like many other people, he was half European, half Cherokee, and became quickly incorporated and gained a good level of eloquence and was eventually chief. Now, Chief Smith, when he was in the Highlanders, he was friends with people like Standwadi who was also active as a general in the Civil War, and Standwadi, as a chief, was one of the last people in the Civil War to finish fighting. And the fighting amongst the Cherokee, and it's so fierce, because they were angry at the U.S. government, which had just a few decades prior sent their tribe on a terrible journey to Oklahoma on the Trail of Tears. So it was more than just North versus South, it was a cultural battle for survival. And Jared Nimrod Smith, after the war was over, remained active in politics. And in North Carolina, he gained recognition for his tribe and even brought this influence of his up to the federal government, gaining recognition for the Eastern Band of Cherokee. And if it weren't for this Confederate War veteran, Jarrett Nimrod Smith, we would not have the town of Cherokee, North Carolina today, and we would not have the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indians. Now, he is buried somewhere in this cemetery, along with many other people who have very interesting and varied stories ranging from World War I to Vietnam to Iraq to Afghanistan. But this is just a snippet of the Cherokee life. Many of these people went to go and join and become veterans and serve the U.S. government after they had been recognized as a federal entity. The rock pile behind me tells a very fascinating local legend that dates all the way back to the Cherokee times. Now it's said that there is a Cherokee princess that's buried underneath this pile of rocks. Her name was Trolita and she lived on Cedar Mountain. And because she lived on Cedar Mountain, she was friends with the Witch of Cedar Mountain, who knew the location of the Hidden Spring of Life. Because of this, she lived to be hundreds and hundreds of years old. However, one day, a Cherokee warrior came along and took her as his wife. And as he removed her from Cedar Mountain, she began to age very, very rapidly. And she was buried underneath a pile of stones. And it became a good luck symbol to leave a stone behind for Trolita. And it became incredibly bad luck to take a stone. Now, the story that I had heard related to me as I drove past this, you know, probably half a dozen times going to the Boy Scout camp just up the road as I was growing up, was that the Georgia Department of Roads, or the Georgia DOT, it tried to build a road through it, and it lost several people over the years by trying to build this road, so they agreed to just build the road next to it. However, in the last couple of years, they've built a roundabout directly around this pile of stones, which I think takes away from its value. And you can see in this photo I'll just throw up on the screen, I think it used to look a lot cooler. It used to look a lot more independent, but now, being in the center of a roundabout because of increased traffic, I just don't really like the look of it, but I'll leave a rock for uh, Trilita's memory.
I've come to the outskirts of the town of Cherokee, North Carolina, to a beautiful hill overlooking the Appalachian Mountains at sunrise to tell the story of William Holland Thomas. Now, for 30 years, Thomas was a chief of the Cherokee Nation in the east, the Cherokee of western North Carolina. And what makes this so remarkable is that he was a white man. Now, his family is very early wrapped up in the earliest history of the United States. His father was cousin to President Zachary Taylor and fought in the Battle of Kings Mountain, and his his mother was relative to the man who founded the state of Maryland. And when the Civil War came along, William Thomas started believing that the Cherokee were being oppressed. He saw the Indian Removal Act and this incensed him. And he took an interest in the Cherokee and because he was their chief for over 30 years, he decided to start advocating for their interests. And in 1861 and 1862, he attended the secession conventions where he argued that the United States had gone astray on their original principles and it was time to form a new country that would be more closely embodying what they had intended originally. And so to do this, he supported the Confederacy and he founded Thomas's Legion. Now, I believe there were several thousand men in this legion, 400 of them Cherokee veterans. And when the Cherokee joined Thomas's legion, this took on a totally different character because the legion was composed of mountain men, hardy pioneers, and Cherokee. And the Cherokee fought in many cases not because of states' rights or because of slavery or because of any of these things. They fought because they viewed the Union as the people which had sent their family on the Trail of Tears not too long prior. They viewed the Union as people who were going to try to massacre them as a race. And the Cherokee, which remained in North Carolina, saw many of their friends and family die on this Trail of Tears. And so it was a, a race for survival. And when they joined Thomas's Legion, it was really just supporting of the idea that they viewed the federal government as people who were their enemy by default. And after the war, Thomas went on to draft a simple government for the Cherokee Nation in, in North Carolina. And this became what is now the town of Cherokee, North Carolina today. Without this, the Cherokee Nation might not be a federally recognized tribe in the southeastern United States. They might be confined to Oklahoma as the federal government had originally intended. And William Thomas, fascinating, fascinating character, and still a hero of many Cherokee and many people who support the Southern cause. Behind me now at the heart of the town of Franklin, North Carolina, is the Nikwasi Mound. Now this is the anglicized version of Nikwasi, which is a Cherokee word meaning place of the stars or star place. And it took on a very sacred overtone for the Cherokee, and the local village would often mine mica objects from the local mountains to use for religious objects which would be worshipped or sort of venerated here at the mound. Now this was also the center of some of the more uh, below land or in the, the foothills of the mountains, Cherokee tribes. And this was at the foot of a river where the British first had contact. Now in 1730, there was a Scottish explorer who arrived here and appointed himself, with no grounding for it, the ambassador to the Cherokee. And this started a good conflict with the Cherokee because he just elected after meeting with the people on top of the mound for two days because there was at the time, it was a sacred area, a large communal gathering on top of it. There was a council house with an eternal flame on it. And he elected a man named Uku Moitoi to be the emperor of the Cherokee. Now, this was only the lowland Cherokee or the Cherokee clustered around this river, but they considered, the British did, the Cherokee to be one united nation. Now, obviously, this wasn't true at all. There were many different clans in the Cherokee, and this created a division between the Cherokee. However, because of the election of Uku Moitoi to be the emperor, a position which, by the way, the Cherokee never had before the British arrived, because of this, they often took a pro-British attitude. And so when the Revolutionary War came about, after the revolution, this town was burned down by white settlers. Now, thank God, they did keep the mound, but 
In 2019, it was actually given back to the uh, tribe. It was given back to the Eastern Band of the Cherokee, who has remained active in the local area somewhat miraculously because they were given land by a Civil War veteran who actually respected their tribe and agreed to al allow them to really live on his property and avoid Indian relocation to places like Oklahoma. But a very sacred spot for the Cherokee, located right next to the river, as you would see from a lot of woodland culture mounds. The majority of Indian mounds that you encounter in the southeast United States are the woodland culture mounds, and this was developed hundreds of years before the Cherokee ever really existed as a tribe as we know them today in the region. However, because the Cherokee used the mounds afterwards, they developed stories, mythologies, and legends surrounding them. And behind me is Nakuchi Mound, and the story around this is basically the same as Romeo and Juliet. The story goes that a daughter from one tribe fell in love with a warrior from another tribe, and when they couldn't be together, they had killed themselves, or they were killed together. And after this, they built this mound over the top of them. Now, the actual dates don't really line up, and there was an excavation here which found 75 members of the woodland culture buried in a communal cemetery. And it was discovered that these burials would have indicated that they would have held a very high degree of esteem in their culture. They would have been warriors, elders, and sort of political or politically involved in the leadership of the tribes. And the woodland culture entirely disappeared, either becoming other cultures, migrating away, or just vanishing to the sands of time. But behind it also is a very sacred mountain, which I think is fascinating, and it tells the story of a figure called Spearfinger. Now, Spearfinger had a sort of terrifying influence on the Cherokee lore. She's sort of their boogeyman type character. And the legend goes that on her right hand, she had an index finger made of just absolutely pure, impenetrable, unbreakable volcanic glass, obsidian that couldn't be chipped or whittled away. And she kept this very well hidden because inside of the palm of her right hand was her heart, her only weak spot. Otherwise, she was unkillable. And she would roam the valley from the mountain behind me, Whitehall Mountain, down to Nantahala Valley and the river there, and she would hunt for Cherokee warriors by sticking this finger in the back of their neck and drawing their livers up through their neck, just killing them instantly. And warriors refused to leave alone or at night because of this. Eventually, she built a bridge near one of these areas which angered the gods who thought that she had gotten too much hubris who struck it down and this is now a pile of rocks in the woods somewhere but a lot of these legends are lost to time probably underneath industrial estates or home developments but you can read more about things like this in the works of james mooney and early sort of you know cultural historians of the cherokee before they were pushed out in the 1830s Not far outside of the town of Cherokee, North Carolina, the headquarters for the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Nation, you have a small hill. And this hill behind me, right over my right shoulder, is called Kitua. And Kitua, in the Cherokee belief system, was their original mother town. This is where the Cherokee first began as a people. Now, it's believed that the Cherokee came down from the Great Lakes region and settled around this area where we're at now, but the Cherokee maintained a council house on top of this mound behind me until the 1760s when it was burned down by the British because of a conflict of interest with the French and the Seven Years' War. Now, the town of Kitua 
was believed to hold immense spiritual importance, and it was also considered one of the seven Cherokee mother towns, the seven towns that really began the Cherokee nation and all of the different subsets and clans within this nation. Now, after Cherokee removal in the 19th century, they left and had to form their own traditional societies. And the more conservative members that did not want to assimilate totally with white culture, traditionally full-blooded Cherokee, formed what was called the Kitua societies. And the Kitua societies maintained these secret religious rituals. And it was only in 1996 that the acres of land behind me were donated and given to the Cherokee Nation in North Carolina. And and this has since become a very important and sacred site for them. Going beyond the area where I've gone now, you'll see signs saying, no trespassing any further than this. There's a fine of $1,000 and you could be arrested by the Cherokee Nation's police. Now, I don't intend on going any further than this, but since 1996, excavations and ground penetrating radar have uncovered a good number of Cherokee burials, although this is kind of kept a secret within the tribe because they don't want it to be public information where the burials are and what kind of information is out there because this information is guarded as tribal knowledge. Their religion is sort of reserved for them and you'll see this reflected in different tribes but behind me is the heart and the beginning of the Cherokee Nation as a people at their own mother town of Kitua. If you were to continue down this road directly in front of me, you would hit the beautiful mountains and the mountain town of Cherokee, North Carolina, which is the headquarters of the Cherokee, which remained behind under a set of very unusual circumstances to continue to form their Cherokee lineage. Now, this is recognized by the federal government as the eastern band of the Cherokee nation, the ones who stayed behind. And behind me now, and directly to my right, is the ancient sacred ceremonial town of Kitua. And Kitua is a mound, and I've already told a little bit of the history of it, but Kitua Kitua itself, if you look at the archaeology of it, is about a thousand years old, and it was an expression of the woodlands culture, or rather the Mississippian culture, a culture which stretched all the way up and down the Mississippi River, along the Ohio River, and to the Great Lakes. And this is through this method, they traded with tribes to the north, they got copper, they got a really a big cultural boost from this area. Now the Cherokee came along and developed themselves as a tribe from the remnants of these lost tribes of the Mississippian period. Their culture kind of fell apart, and from that falling apart, they coalesced in areas, and the ones that coalesced in the area that we're in now became the Cherokee Nation. And specifically, they coalesced right around this town and six other towns, which formed the seven mother towns of the Cherokee people. Now, the hill directly to the right of me, this is an earlier expression. This is the Mississippian Hill, although it was used by the Cherokee, much like another one we'll see later in this video, as a place for a communal gathering where they would hold meetings, discuss the different political factions forming within the tribe, and sort of hold their ceremonies. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the formation of the Kitua societies after relocation was in reference to the hill behind me the Kitua settlement. And these Kitua societies are still around. In fact, there is a federally recognized Kitua branch of the Cherokee Nation still in Oklahoma. I've come out to Western North Carolina to tell the tragic story of Jonaluska. Now, Jonaluska was a Cherokee man and a war leader. And to understand his role in the war, you have to understand a little bit of the history between them, the Cherokee tribe, and the Creeks. Now, for hundreds of years, there was a real conflict. They were competing for land and resources, and the Creeks were fighting with the Cherokee. Now, when the Americans gained their independence, this took on a new character because whites began settling in traditionally Cherokee 
Cherokee and Creek lands. And the Creek Nation split into two, the White Sticks, which favored peace and assimilation, and the Red Sticks, which were nationalists and wanted their own state and their own religion, and they wanted recognition. So naturally, in 1812, the British came over and allied with the Red Sticks, believing that they would give them weapons and ammunition and training, and that they would attack the American settlers, push them out, and the British could finally nip the American colonialists in the bud. Well, this didn't really pan out well for the Red Sticks, partly because of Junaluska, and also because of General Andrew Jackson. And the penultimate battle of this war pitted a large number of Cherokee, hundreds of them, led and recruited by Junaluska, who recruited over a hundred of them himself, and they pitted them, along with Jackson, against the more traditionalist faction of Red Stick Creek. And this happened at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. And it's said that the uh, Cherokee, led by Junaluska, waded across the river at the, you know, real ultimate moment of the battle and rallied the Cherokee against their old enemies, the Creek, and defeated them. And it's also said that he saved Andrew Jackson's life. Now, this is obviously a very real conflict of interest. Andrew Jackson gave him medals. He gave him hundreds of acres of land, which were later taken by white squatters. He gave him recognition. He gave him $100, which at the time was quite a bit of money. But then he passed Indian removal. Of course, he exempted him from Indian removal, but both of Junaluska's children and his wife died on the Trail of Tears. And later in his life, Junaluska said that if he had been there, not only would he have let this man take the shot at Andrew Jackson, he would have killed Jackson himself. He would have never been involved with the war. And he regretted not joining with the Native American uprising of 1811 with Tecumseh, which he really had a real chance of joining. But he told Tecumseh that he would not let the Cherokee join in a confederation against the settlers. So he looked back at his life much the same way as the man who saved Hitler's life in the trenches of France in World War I, and he regretted it. I'm about to show you an old trick I learned in the Eagle Scouts here. Uh, if you go to areas, not along rivers and lakes, but areas that are moist, but well-drained with sandy soil, you'll find plants like this one, whose leaves look a little bit like dinosaur tracks. And if you kind of squish them up, oh, Eagle Scout ring, they smell exactly like uh, root beer, right? So this is the sassafras plant, and if you were to take a shovel and pull it up by the root system there, you would have a very, very nice, good-sized root that you could kind of clean off and then boil. But you can see they're actually growing as trees up here, just because the soil quality is so good. And you would have a very nice root beer if you just put a little bit of sugar in that, which I think is really cool. Perfect for kind of camping trips. Put sassafras, you can see it's growing all around here. And it takes sometimes quite a while to find a good spot for it. But uh, this is a state park, so I'm not going to like put the shovel in the ground and take the root system out. But you really need to get the deep roots if you want to get actual root beer flavor. I'm standing now at one of the most mysterious and consistently overlooked places in the state of Georgia. And uh, Fort Mountain, which is a state park, has this ancient wall on top of it, which was a sacred place for the Cherokee people. When the white settlers came in, they found these stone ruins and they asked them, who built this? And the Cherokee had no idea really, but they did have stories. And one of my favorite stories is that of the Moon-Eyed people. And the Cherokee said that the Moon-Eyed people were a very strange tribe that used unusual implements, and they were called Moon-Eyed because they couldn't see well during the day. So when the moon was out, they attacked them and wiped out their tribe, and then took this wall in this area which belonged to them. They lived on top of this mountain, and they took it as their own. And then eventually it became sort of a Cherokee honeymoon spot, but the Cherokee maintained that they never built it. 
Well, when white settlers came in, they came in from England. And these settlers were saying things like, we believe that they belonged to Prince Maddock and that his group made it over up the Mississippi from Alabama and then came into the North Georgia mountains. And this legend stems from the fact that when uh, the last true prince of all of Wales died, all of his siblings and all of his sons and daughters were competing for the title to the throne. And one named Maddock just set sail from Ross on Sea in North Wales and returned years later saying, we found this land that we've sort of dedicated to poetry and the arts and having fun. So he loaded his ships up with a bunch of booze and set sail again and was never seen again. So the legend is that he came to the new world. And I think that this myth is sort of kind of rooted in this racist attitude that the Cherokee people couldn't really build in stone like this, but they didn't really build in stone like this. Now, that isn't to say that obviously Native Americans couldn't build this because there are other stone stone walls all around Georgia. There's the Rock Eagle. There's even Etowah Indian Mounds, but those are much earlier than the Cherokee. But this legend has persisted, as well as other legends that it was built by DeSoto as his expedition came through, although he was probably miles and miles away from this area. And these walls, although sacred to the Cherokee, have a very mysterious origin. And I think the story of the Moon-Eyed people is probably one of the one of my favorite kind of old America myths on our founding. You know, it would render America a rightful wealth colony, which I think is kind of fascinating. And behind me now is another part of this ancient wall on top of Fort Mountain. And the ranges from its use and the speculations range from, you know, the Welsh, the Britons, DeSoto, other lost tribes, the same tribes that built Rock Eagle. And uh, it's fascinating because they, they conjecture about its use. I mean, there's anywhere between 19 and 29 different divots in it and the remains of an old gate opening but it seems to only be a singular wall it didn't actually encompass the top of this like an old hill fort would although it looks like sort of a half of a hill fort it's about 800 feet long and it's mostly covered now in trees but if you look over here you can't really see but let me alter this camera a bit if you were to pan over that kind of continues in sort of a divot that would have served possibly as a sort of guard outpost, but who knows what it was for. It could have been different stages of the sun. It could have been different times of year, you know, sort of archaeoastronomy type stuff, but it's 800 feet long. And who knows? They, I mean, websites say that they don't know how old it is scientifically, but tourist websites kind of venture to guess about 500 AD, but they have absolutely no proof of that.